Thank you very much. Good to see a nice crowd out here on a beautiful day like today. Uh, as you said, my name is Chris Cosley. I am from the, uh, the Michigan Military Technical and Historical Society Museum in East Point. Uh, our museum's goal is to tell the story of Michigan and its contribution to the defense of this uh, great nation over the last century or so. Uh, we start out really with World War I and go forward from there. Uh, there are some brochures up here on the stage about our museum if you wanted to pick up one of those up and uh, come visit us. Oh, got to turn it on. So we've already talked about that. So I like to call this the dress rehearsal for the arsenal of democracy, uh, Michigan's uh, industry in the First World War. So I want to give a little bit of background. Uh, you know, in the uh, first, when we entered into the First World War, the United States was still very much an isolationist nation. Uh, we held the Founding Fathers' distrust for a standing army. Uh, we were not a major military power. Military spending well, was not a priority at all, and isolationism was the norm. Uh, I like to kind of say is that the, there's a quote from George Washington that said, military contractors were enough to make one curse one's own species. <laughs> so you kind of get the idea. I mean, really, if you think about it, the, the whole taxation without representation thing was a, was a direct result of the, of the French and Indian Wars. And they believed that if you have a standing army, you're going to be tempted to use it to justify its existence. And so uh, we, really, we really worked on the basis that when war came, you stood up an army. When war was over, you broke it back down again. And uh, so up until World War I, actually up until the end of World War II, that was still very much the, the case. So this is actually a quote from, uh, there's this lovely brown book up here that is the uh, history of the ordnance, Depart uh, the ordnance district from World War I. It was a 13 volume set uh, they, the, they broke the nation up into 13 ordinance districts and, uh, for World War I. And this quote comes out of that book that basically says, in effect, is American policy, American law, that the country shall enter any war of, of consequence from a standing start. So really what they are saying, at this point in time, what we today call the military-industrial complex was considered to be illegal. There we go. So by the time the United States enters into World War I, the war has been raging in Europe for three years. The United States was well, well behind the curve on military technology, and most of the weapons that we will go to war with are of European design. Uh, at this point in time, the, uh, the American military did not have a real centralized procurement branch. I should say the Army did not. The Navy, the Navy was considered to be the, uh, the, the, Amer the nation's first line of defense, and it's, especially after Teddy Roosevelt, it's outward projection of power. So the Navy was always better funded, and so they, they had contracting and they had procurement arms that were much more robust. The Army was considered to be something that was only needed when there was a war. So they didn't have a lot of procurement, and at that point in time, each one of the branches, so the Signal Corps, Quartermaster Corps, you know, engine, Corps of Engineers, each one of them had their own procurement system, each one of them had their own arsenals, they had their own depots, and they didn't actually buy stuff from manufacturers. Most of the things that were used by the, by the Army at this point in time were built by their internal depot and system, in, uh, systems that they had. Um, so it's very interesting, so when we go into World War I, there is no real plan for industrial mobilization because it was always assumed that the arsenal system would be able to pick up and supply the army. And in World War I, that changes, and that changes very dramatically. <clears throat> so again, we have another quote from our book. Um, basically reiterates what we, we just said, yeah, that the Americans had to spool up on the arts of destruction and had to do it quickly. 
So we kind of just talked a little bit about that. That you know, each one of the divisions had its own procurement arm, and a lot of times they were com they were competing with each other for raw materials and uh, and actually bidding against each other. It was it was a mess. It, it was it was a mess of epic proportion. But what made the United States really stand out at that point in time and that point in history? It was what came to be called the American system of manufacturing. You know, in the latter half of the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, we had developed a system by which you could mass produce items with interchangeable parts and uh, using relatively unskilled labor. At that point, in, during World, at the World War I point in history, it was commonly referred to as Fordism. Uh, Henry Ford did not invent uh, mass production. Uh, he definitely took it to a new level with, his, with the moving assembly line and the things he did at Highland Park. And, and the fact he was just a, he was a real good promoter. And so he's kind of gone down in history as the, the guy who, who perfected it. But there were a lot of people that came before him, and there were a lot of people that worked for, that worked for him that made it possible. So ironically, the entire concept of mass production came from the Ordnance Department. And it was really, a, it was kind of a byproduct of the Mexican, uh, the Mexican-American Wars, and a little bit of like coming out of the War of 1812, but especially the Mexican-American War, where they realized that you, if a gun broke, you needed a gunsmith to fix it. You couldn't just take, you couldn't take two guns and mix the parts together and come out and fix one another because everything was hand fitted, everything was handmade. So it was really Springfield Arsenal that started the entire process. And by the time the Civil War came around, we were well on our way to making standardized weapons with, uh, that had interchangeable parts. And the European nations were really noticing this and they were sending emissaries over to look at it and investigate what we were doing. And then people like Cyrus McCormick and Singer and Ford really kind of took it and ran with it. And one of the byproducts is that the United States also had this incredibly robust machine tool industry because one of the things you need to make interchangeable parts is machine tools. And so we ended up having a very robust machine tool industry and it just sort of it put us in a position to really to make things that, that needed to be made. So Michigan's industry in the First World War, the contribution was uh, varied and it was, it was incredibly significant. Uh, here's a couple of examples of things that were made. Uh, Sparks and Whittington made hand grenade bodies, you know, White Star uh, knitting, made underwear and socks. Edmonds and Jones made uh, meat cans and mess gear. There's just way too much to really talk about in, in the time we have allotted. So we're gonna kind of focus in on a couple specific uh, examples. Uh, one thing that I do want to like to point out is that American industry was involved in the First World War before the United States actually entered the war. And we were doing great. We were, economically, this nation was, was running strong because one example is prior to 1914, a lot of the world's toys came from Germany. They were a predominant toy manufacturer. You know, night, World War I starts, the Germans, are embar the Germans are focused on the war and they're embargoed. So American companies begin picking up the slack and America becomes a, a major manufacturer and exporter of children's toys. And that's just one example. And there there we started to see a labor shortage because we were picking up the slack for a lot of these European countries and the manufacturing. Plus we were taking in orders for military goods and raw materials. So you had labor rates were going up and then the, you had this newly prosperous workforce that was deriving a demand for more and more High, higher end consumer goods. So the, the market was actually reaching a point where it was saturated. And the American entry into World War I was probably the worst thing that could happen to the American economy because suddenly you had to shift focus from you know, 
feeding the, the not just selling stuff to the, to the, the warring nations in Europe, but the, the demand that was organic to the United States based on this, this improvement in the economic standing. And then World War I comes along and then we have to, you, you, end up, the, the, you end up with the draft. So your workforce shortage is exasperated and then throw the, the flu pandemic on top of that. You have major shortage of workforce. You have major raw materials issues. You have major transportation issues. And the fact that the economy survived is really kind of a statement just because the war didn't last that long. If the war had gone a little bit longer, you might have seen some, ser some serious economic damage. But there were also some smart people that were keeping, it, keeping things from crashing. So our first example we're going to talk a little about is Ford and the Eagle Boat. So there's your Eagle Boat right there. <clears throat> So Henry Ford, any, any Ford fans out here? So Henry Ford was a little strange. I guess that's, but he was, he, he was, a, you have to give him credit. He was a pacifist. He really, I think he really believed it. And uh, he was opposed to the war. You know, Wilson was trying to get him involved and he was like, no, oh, I don't really want to deal with it. But once the United States entered into the war, he, he's like, okay, the, my country's in the war, I have to support it. And it's very similar to what happened in World War II, except World War II was more Edsel than it was Henry, but that's a whole other lecture. So uh, the United States, we had a horrible shortage of ships in general. It's actually one of the reasons why most of the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight never made it to France, is because we had a tremendous shipping shortage, uh, and we were focused on sending soldiers across the Atlantic and not equipment. So most of the American GIs that arrived in France fell in on French and British stores that were already there. Uh, very, very little equipment that, was, that we actually produced ever made it across because the, the whole shipping situation was never really, was not resolved in a timely fashion and, and the war ended somewhat abruptly in, in 1918. <clears throat> And then we also had this brand new thing, uh, submarine warfare. The Germans had uh, embraced it. They had run with it. Um, the Lusitania is often quoted as the reason why America went into the war. I, I think the Zimmerman telegram was probably more uh, at fault. Uh, but again, that's a topic for another lecture. We don't, we don't want to go down rabbit holes. We don't have enough time. Uh, but the Navy was looking at 21 separate kinds of anti-submarine warfare vessel at that point in time. And Henry was like, why don't you just pick one and just make a lot of them? So they gave Ford the contract. January of 1918, they, uh, they were received a contract to build between 100 and 500 submarine chasers. Uh, it was not a Ford design vessel. It was a Navy design. Uh, Ford did make some modifications to it to uh, make it more mass producible. Uh, one of the big changes Ford made is at that point in time, ships' hulls were traditionally made out of rolled steel. And uh, Ford said it was, it'd be quicker and easier to make it out of flat steel and rivet it together. And all of the shipbuilding people are like, that will never work. That ship will not hold up in, in, he in, in heavy seas. It'll, it'll rock. It'll tip over. Uh, they were wrong. It actually worked. But... Uh, but that was one of the big changes. He made some changes to the propulsion system and, and some things like that. But this really was the birth of the Rouge. Ha Henry Ford had just bought a piece of uh, you know, swamp land along the Rouge River at that point in time. And the very first building at the Rouge complex was the Eagle Boat building. So they, uh, they broke ground and they started building the boats. But yeah, and again, it kind of foreshadows, because I, I like to say this is the dress rehearsal for the arsenal of democracy. This kind of foreshadows what happens with Ford later at Willow Run, is they begin building the plant, and they're, they're, working, on, they're working on the ships before the plant is even done. Uh, they're, they're manufacturing the parts at other Ford plants and, ship, and rolling them into the Rouge for assembly. They are, they're busing in workers because at that time the Rouge was in the middle of nowhere. 
And so they set up a transportation system, they set up a road network, and for anybody who knows the Willow Run story, that's very much what happened there. So what were the results? So remember now, the contract signed in January of 1918. The armistice is on the 11th of November 1918, and Eagle Boat number one and Eagle Boat number two were delivered prior to the armistice. So you're really looking at, I mean, a traditional shipbuilder would have barely laid the keel in that time frame. So they, they cranked out two boats, and then uh, three and four were signed over right after the armistice. So it actually, it, it, it worked, and everybody who said these ships would not work in the ocean was wrong. The ships actually proved to be quite, you know, quite seaworthy. But it, Ford had provided proof of concept that you could mass produce a capital ship using mass production assembly line methodology. And in World War II, you'd see this, uh, Ford never really ventured back into, into shipbuilding. But if you, any, you know, if you know World War II, you know what Kaiser did. Uh, right here in, Mich in Michigan, Defoe Shipbuilding, they, they figured out ways to mass produce ships. I mean, they were incredibly innovative. They built the ships upside down so they didn't have to weld up. You could weld down. And they, when the ship was done, they rolled it over and put it in the water. So, I mean, without, really, without Henry and this little experiment, you might never have seen that. Uh, for anybody, for those of you who are interested, no Eagle boats actually obviously saw service in World War I. Uh, eight Eagle boats were still in the U.S. Navy uh, in the Second World War. They were used primarily for training. Uh, but one Eagle boat was actually sunk, uh, was lost to enemy action. Uh, Eagle boat number 56 was uh, sunk by a torpedo uh, by ger the German U-boat uh, U-853 off the coast of Maine in 1945. So it almost made it to the end of the war and it was, it was sunk shortly before uh, VE Day. So another place where, the, uh, where Michigan kind of had a major contribution was uh, aviation. Uh oh, what did I just do? Okay, wrong button. So the United States really was the birthplace of powered flight and, but after, but the French, the French were really right behind us. And the French really, the French and the British both, but really the French ran with aviation and, and, and they've left us in the dust. And in World War I, all the warring nations capitalized on the, the military aviation and the use of aircraft in war. When we entered into World War I, all we really had was the JN-5, which was not a particularly great plane. And we had never, we had never mounted a weapon on an aircraft you know, prior, prior to the entry into the war. Anybody trivia, anybody know who the first American pilot was to be shot at in an aircraft? You know? It was Byron Q. Jones. You know what his Michigan connection is? He was the first commander of Selfridge Air Base when it, in, when it opened in 1917. Uh, he was a pilot with the, uh, the punitive expedition in Mexico. He was flying a JN-5 looking for Pancho Villa, and he found some of Villa's men and took ground fire from them. So he, he has the distinction of being the first American aviator to be shot at in a combat situation. And he then came up here to Michigan and was the first base commander. I do know Selfridge is named after the guy who was killed by one of the experimental pilots yes. in the Army Air Force. Yeah, Lieutenant Selfridge was, uh, was killed with, he was killed in a crash. He was flying with Orville, I believe. I so, yeah. And the, so he was the first American military casualty is uh, Lieutenant Selfridge. And then the first American military aviator to be shot at was Byron Q. Jones, who became the commander of Selfridge Air Base. So it's useless trivia 101. If so the Army Air Corps, we enter into the First World War. Uh, it really was relegated at that point in time as a branch of the Signal Corps. Uh, it really, it, nobody really gave military aviation a lot of serious thought. It, 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 it didn't really occur until six months prior to our entry into the war in April 1917 that they really started putting some money into procuring aircraft, and it was too little too late at that time. Uh, 
it kind of gives you an idea. We entered into the war. Aviation section had 52 officers, 1,100 listed men, and 200 civilian workers, which I like to point out as them pesky civil servants. They were there even then. And I can say that because I'm one of them. But. And only 26 certified pilots. So that's, uh, so that's, how we go, that's how we went to war. And we didn't have any aircraft that were worth a damn. We weren't. The, the JN-4 was not the greatest airplane. So the Americans made the decision that, that for fighter aircraft, single-seat fighters, we would use European designs. A lot of the, we used the, the Newports and the SPADs and some of the, you know, a lot of the French-built and some British-built aircraft. And the single-seat fighter production would remain in Europe. We would buy or use aircraft provided by the manufacturers in Europe. The American military or the American aviation industry that was going to be created to support the First World War would focus on multi-seat aircraft that could be used for training, uh, observation, bombing, and in the case of the, D, the DH-4 was kind of more, it was, a, it was kind of a multi-role aircraft at that point in time. And the British, the de Havilland DH-4, we would improve by repowering it with the Liberty engine, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. So three American companies really produced uh, aircraft, uh, Dayton Wright, Fisher Body, Standard Aircraft. The Fisher Body right here in Detroit is, is the one that we're going to kind of focus on. Uh, 1,213 of the de Havilland DH-4s were shipped to Europe. It's the only American built aircraft to see any kind of action. Uh, it's interesting is I'm actually working on a on a paper, a, a new, another paper, and I was reading up about this the other night, and apparently the DH-4s that went to Europe were only the observation models. Uh, we, we had a tremendous problem with the bomb release mechanism. The American-made bomb release mechanisms didn't work, and we, didn't, and we never mounted guns on them. So we used them primarily as observation aircraft. So they were never used in, a, in an actual offensive role. And so it's, it's an interesting, one of those interesting things. And there's a, there's a huge post-war investigation into the, all the shortcomings of the, of the uh, American aviation community during the First World War that actually went on until like 1955. They were still, there were still congressional hearings about it in 1955 talking about it. So. But it's interesting is that you know, we made 4,846 de Havilland DH-4s here in the United States in an 18 month period of time. The British, in the entire course of the war, only made 1,449 of them. So mass production does work. And again, if anybody's familiar with the Willow Run story, it takes time to work all the bugs out of these things. I mean, we went from, went from zero to 100 so the fact that you know the bomb release mechanisms didn't work after 18 months of production is, you know, it's really, yeah, okay, we we we're trying to figure this stuff out still. So there's your DH4. Uh, these photographs we're going to look at right now are all from the the Fisher Body Plant here in Detroit. Uh, so that's your uh, there's your DH4 coming down the line. Uh, this is also Fisher Body Plant. Uh, I'm assuming this is a training aircraft because normally you would not have the gun mounted in it without having any of the skin on it. So this is probably one that they had there for familiarization. I love this picture because there they are making all the wings. And 25 years later, so we learned something. <laughs> you know, Fisher body, uh, the, one of the things that we also see in World War I is a, is a large influx of uh, women workers into the, into the industry. Uh, I would, I like to say that if World War I had lasted into 1919 and the 1919 offensive had gone on, like it, that was planned, instead of Rosie the Riveter, we might be talking about Sally the Seamstress, but there, this has got to be a posed picture because they're all they're all too uniform and it's just but it's still an awesome picture. 
I'd like to talk a little briefly about the Grand Rapids Airplane Company. I think this is kind of a cool story. So you know what Grand Rapids is known for is furniture, right? So in Grand Rapids, 15 different furniture companies got together and they decided they were going to build the Handley Page 0400 bomber. Everything on an aircraft at that point in time was really wooden fabric, which is furniture. And they were good at that. So with the exception of the engines, the entire aircraft was built in Grand Rapids. And some of the aircraft, they, they were crated up and they were shipped over uh, to England, but none of them were assembled uh, before, the, before the armistice. And I, I just, it is such a stupid looking plane. I mean, that, and this is, a, this is definitely an American one because it's got the American markings on it. But that's, that was your state-of-the-art long-range bomber in 1917, 1918. That's your B-24 of the, of the day. Where did they hold the bombs? You know, I, I think this did have a bomb bay on it. And it had the, and then you, know, you had the, the, engines, the engines up on the, out, on the riggers. You had a guy up in the nose with a machine gun. You know, how that thing flew, I will not understand. <laughs> but, but we built them here in Michigan. And there's some of the you know, propellers. The propellers were a huge part of it. And a lot of the, lot of the Grand Rapids companies you know, went from making furniture, tables, and chairs to making propellers. And I absolutely love his balancing jig there. It's just so, he's balancing that prop on this little teeter-totter thing. <clears throat> so one place where we really did make a contribution uh, to, and maybe not so much to World War I, because a lot of, again, a lot of these did not arrive in time, but just to, to aviation in general, was in the, the world of aviation engines. So the, the Europeans were well ahead of us on aircraft design, but they didn't, nobody had a really good engine. And everybody was kind of dabbling. I mean, you think about the British had 30, 37 different engines. The French had 46 engines. The Germans had eight different engines. Can you imagine being like a, a supply guy at one of these aerodromes trying to order you know, spark plugs or whatever and trying to figure out what I need to keep on the shelf to keep my airplanes flying you know, when I got 46 different kinds of engines? So one of the things, this is also a place where the, where the Europeans came to the United States prior to the American entry into the war and said, hey, can you make engines for us? And we were like, sure, why not? But the problem is, is that the Europeans built everything by hand, you know, one at a time, lovingly handcrafted. And so the Americans are like, oh, you want us to build this? Send us over some drawings and some specifications. So they sent our stuff over, and the stuff that came from France was in this metric system. What, what, what is that? <laughs> and there's one, one of the things I read is like, I believe it was on the, Duro, on the Lerone engine, there was a material call out for this, I believe it was the cylinder head. And the engineer's like, if we make the cylinder head out of this alloy, it's going to melt. So whoever did the drawing was apparently, you know, they weren't, they weren't spending a whole lot of time. So the Americans are like, fine, you know what, just send us a couple engines and we'll reverse engineer them. But that takes time. So, I mean, it, it took 13 months to reverse engineer the Hispano Souza. It took eight months to get the Lerone up and functioning. So, I mean, this is a time consuming process. So the Americans, in one of the rare instances of the government doing something that made sense, said, you know what, we have some really good engine people in this country. Let's, let's see if we can figure out a way to make this better. So they're like, let's make one engine and standardize it, make it modular, and build a whole ton of them and make it interchangeable. <clears throat> So they, they went out and they picked a couple of, of guys and uh, anybody here who's familiar with Packard and the automotive industry probably knows Jesse Vincent. Uh, Jesse Vincent was an uh, was automotive engineer and designer for Packard. Uh, he should be a household name because a lot of the things he invented are, are still standard on your car. Uh, E.J. Hall, uh, if you're into vintage boats, you're probably familiar with him. He was from the Hall Scott engine. Uh, which was the standard of marine engines at that time from they were on the on the west coast of the country so they take hall and vincent 
and they get a suite at the, uh, the Willard Hotel and they throw them in there with a couple of French aviation engineers and uh, Colonel E.A. Deeds, who is a fascinating, if you ever want to read a fascinating character, he was, he was actually one of the founders of the Dayton Electronics, uh, Delco, Dayton Electronics Company. He was close friends with Kettering. He, he's part of the mammoth investigation of the American aviation uh, effort after the war because they believe that he used his position to funnel aviation contracts to all of his buddies in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, so he's either, depending on your point of view, he's either a hero or he's crooked as a dog's hind leg. But he's a, he's a fascinating character. And he was definitely an opportunist. So they decide that they're going to develop a family of engines that could be built as either 4, 6, 8, or 12 cylinder and along a common design with interchangeable components. And one of the really kind of cool things is that they're given the keys to the Bureau of Patents and Standards, and they're like, everything is on the table. You go in there, and you, if you see something you, you think will work, use it. So, and that, that included some enemy stuff. The only, real, the only real direction they were given was, do not use anything experimental. We want you to use all proven designs, which ends up not really being the case because one of the things that Colonel Deeds did was convince them to, in, up, at the, up until that point, all aviation engines used magnetos and he convinced them to put a regular distributor on it because that meant that Delco would get the contract and he was on the board of Delco. So that was one of the things he was investigated for. So they, they go in there and they come up with a design and they, Let's see, did I have the dates here? So on May 17th, or May 1917, they go into the hotel. They come out, and they come here to Detroit, and they borrow a bunch of draftsmen from the major auto companies at that time, and they say, here, and, and they make the drawing, make official drawings. July 4th, 1917, so from May, June, July, from May, you, you, you started with a blank sheet of paper. On July 4th, 1917, the first engine is built and it's uh, one of the eight cylinder and it's delivered to the government for testing. So we go back to that Hispano Susan, the Lerone that took 13 months, eight months just to come up with drawings. We went from nothing to a working prototype May, June, July. <clears throat> so we were kind of centered the production of the Liberty engine here in the Detroit area. Uh, with the auto industry, and then obviously a lot of it got funneled down into Dayton as well, uh, thanks to Mr. Deeds. But uh, everybody was involved, and there was a lot of cross population of, uh, of design. Uh, like at that point in time, Ford had come up with a new Babbitt bearing, and they opted to share that technology with the other auto industries, and they, they improved the, the bearing system on the engine dramatically with this new technology that they had developed. So it was very similar to what you saw again in World War II where, the, where the, what normally would be competing companies were sharing technology for the, for the greater good and for the war effort. So Liberty engine, four cylinder, how many did we build? We built two. Six cylinder, uh, 52, no big deal. 15 of the eight cylinders, 20,478 12 cylinders. And again, most of these did not make it over to France for the war effort, but this engine revolutionized engines. It, it really changed engine design. And you, a lot of the engines that you saw post-war, I mean like the, the, the Merlins, the, the Allisons, they all, can draw some inspiration back to this engine. The Russians got a hold of these and copied them. And the, the, the diesel engine that was in the T-34 tank is, the block design is based on the Liberty engine. So it's a, it was a game changer. And they were used extensively post-war. A lot of the, uh, Miss the Miss America race boats that Gar Wood campaigned out there on the St. Clair River were powered by them. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the race aircraft of the 20s and the 30s were powered by them. Uh, Christie, Christie built the tank that the Americans didn't, did not adopt, but the, the Soviets kind of copied. He, he used Liberty surplus Liberty engines in his tank. 
And so there's the, the father of the Air Force at that point in time, Major Hap Arnold, with the, with the granddaddy of the air aviation engines. So anybody know World War I became a stalemate in, in, a tr in trench warfare? Does anybody here know why? What caused the, everybody to dig in and seek shelter underground? How many people think it was the machine gun? How many people think it was that? Yeah. Artillery. World War I was an artillery war. And why was World War I an artillery war? The French, 75. In 1898, the French came up with this thing called the recuperator. And it was basically a giant shock absorber that you put on the gun. Now, you've all seen you know, the old pirate movies or the Civil War movies where they fire the cannon and the cannonball goes that way and the cannon goes that way and then they've got to figure out to put it all back together again and load the next round. Well, with the recuperator, you fire the round, that cannon stays where it was. So you, you, you can increase the rate of fire, you can increase the accuracy of fire. The recuperator allowed for non-line of sight artillery. You know, all seen the movies where the guy is up on the hill going, you know, left 200, right, drop 200, fire for effect. That's why. Because with the, with the recuperator, when you fired the round, the gun stayed put. The round went out, you fired the next round, it would, go, it would follow the same trajectory, theoretically, you know, with minor adjustment. So these recuperators are obviously very important to the war effort. Uh, so they come to the United States and they're like, hey, can you build us recuperators? And the Dodge brothers, who I, if I could go back in time, I would hang out with them. I, they'd send, I bet you they were fun. <laughs> Those two guys seemed like the kind of people you could hang out and go to the bar with. <clears throat> but they're like, what, what's a recuperator? I'm like, yeah, what the hell, I'll make it. So it was very similar. The recuperator was just like everything else. The French made them lovingly, one by one, hand fitted. You know, so the, so the Dodge brothers were like, okay, we'll, we'll do it. So they built the $11 million factory in Detroit specifically to build the recuperators. Uh, it was on, somewhere on Lynch Road, if anybody wants to know. Lynch Road and Mount Elliott, if you, for those of you who want useless trivia 101. <clears throat> and they set out on manufacturing the recuperators. Uh, it's actually what they did, and this is actually the name of a chapter in, that, in the lovely Braun book up here, is the, it's referred to as a remarkable performance. Because they took, and, and this, is, this is kind of an eye chart, but for those of you that are, that are machinists, you'll appreciate that these items, they, they got these steel billets from Carnegie Steel, and they came in you know, weighing 7,800 pounds, and then they machined them down to this finely honed, and I mean, you can see how much down here, you can see how much they machined off of these things. And they did a mammoth amount of work, and they got, and, and they were producing them uh, 17 per day by the time the, uh, by the time the war ended. You know, and the French, the French were making, you know, if they were making one a week, you were lucky. The, the Dodge brothers were doing 17 per day. So, it's one of those cases where, uh, where mass production definitely worked. And, then, you know, and again, a lot of the stuff never made it over. Uh, at the end of the war, th this was, and this was also another one of those uh, early, it was a GOCO, a government-owned contractor operated. The government paid for the plant, the government paid for the machining, and Dodge operated it. When the war was over, the government kept the plant for a brief period of time, and then they realized they didn't need it anymore. They took all the equipment out of it, shipped it down to the Rock Island Arsenal, and they tore the plant down and gave the land back to Dodge. So, well, again, you know, Willow Run. You know, when the war was over, they auctioned it off. Ford didn't want, you know, Ford didn't want it. So gun tubes, another place. Uh, you know, we talked about a little bit about the arsenal system. The, the government had four arsenals capable of manufacturing gun tubes. 
and we expanded that to 19. And one of them was here in Detroit, Chalkis Manufacturing Company. Another, it was another government-owned contractor operated facility. And then uh, after the war, they went back to the Arsenal system, which I think is funny because actually gun tubes are one of the few things that are still built under the Arsenal system today. They, they're not actually farmed out to uh, private manufacturers. They're still done, they're done in an Arsenal. Rock Island is one of the primary manufacturers to this day. So one of the things that's very important, everybody knows the song, everybody, any army guys here wanna sing? So we talked about the, the recuperator, we talked about the increased rate of fire, the increased accuracy. Caissons are what carry the ammunition. So caissons become a very important thing. And this is actually one of the places where the auto industry is like, oh, these things, you know, they're just, a, they're a box and an axle and well, this is very similar to car parts. So it was a very natural transition. You know, why caissons mattered, you know, said artillery consumption. So here's one of those kind of, no, here's useless trivia 101 again. Uh, previously, each gun had one caisson and shared a second one. Uh, once you introduced uh, the recuperator and rapid firing artillery, each gun required three caissons. So now every gun had four vehicles and plus a horse team or a tractor to pull them. So you can think your artillery train starts getting longer and longer and your logistics tail gets longer and longer. Uh, the French actually reduced the size of their core artillery because they realized that they, they, you could do the same amount of fire or more with fewer guns. So uh, typical German corps had 144 guns. The French had 92 guns per core, but they still were able to produce a higher rate and more accurate fire. Uh, one of the major manufacturers of caissons and limbers is the American Car and Foundry Company here in Detroit. Uh, you can see there they all are all lined up waiting to be delivered. Most of them never left the country. Uh, here again you can see uh, women war workers. Uh, I always like to point out that you know, the, the camouflage, I, I, the, this, this is right from the American Car and Foundry uh, propaganda book that they did after the war. Those are the actual colors. And you can see there's a very, the paint jobs are very consistent. So this was not just some kind of helter-skelter kind of thing. They're very consistent. And at one point in time, the American Car and Foundry storage lot was actually the largest artillery park in the United States. There was more artillery uh, caissons and equipment sitting in the, in the American Car and Foundry property and in Detroit than there was on a military installations in the country. Because again, transportation backlog was a huge factor. So some of the automotive companies that produced stuff, the American Car and Foundry Company, they made the 75 millimeter caissons. Uh, Dodge Brothers of Detroit um, made the shot trucks and rammer trucks, howitzer windlasses, all, you know, all the things you need to load big guns. Ford, Ford Motor Company made uh, 4.7 inch gun caissons. Uh, there's actually a picture of one of the Ford built 4.7 caissons at the Henry Ford Museum. And I have a suspicion it was one of the things they auctioned off in the early 80s when they got rid of Jeep number one, because uh, it's not there anymore. Uh, Maxwell Motors made uh, 155 limbers. The Studebaker, which was primarily from South Bend, Indiana, but at that time still had a Detroit facility, uh, also made the 4.7 uh, gun carriages. They made three per day for 380 total. We also made a lot of projectiles. You have to remember that uh, the automotive industry, to support it, you had a lot of casting capability, you had a lot of machining capability. So you had a lot of companies here that had the ability to, to cast cast iron, to you know, to machine, do fine machining on it. Uh, I know that like GM made some how inner rounds and it, if you're, anybody's familiar with, a, with an artillery round, you've got a cast iron body and it's got the bronze driving bands that seal it to the, that seal it to the gun tube and bite into the rifling and make it spin. I know that the General Motors or United Motors at that time had a, tremendous problems with the, getting the steel, the bronze driving bands to fit properly. And the, so they, they, well, there was a tremendous learning curve. Uh, most of the rounds were not filled with explosive here. They were just raw. There was a, 
Center, Center Powder Company was actually making explosives in Michigan. But the rounds left, most of the rounds left the state. It's just empty, empty casings will be filled later. Uh, I think it was Edgewood Arsenal was the, over in the East Coast is where most of, where most of the rounds were filled before they went overseas. So this is a, like a laundry list of lost car companies. Haroon Motor Car Company, Ireland Matthews, Jackson Munitions Company, you know, Page, which later became Graham Page, Maxwell Motor, Michigan Stamping, you know, Muller Motor, Sparks and Whittington. Sparks and Whittington made a ton of stuff. And they made a ton of stuff in the Second World War as well. Uh, Studebaker, U.S. Radiator, <coughs> Wilson Foundry. So, I mean, th we made a ton of ammunition in all different kinds. Uh, total, the total production of ammunition in this country was about 3.5 million rounds. <coughs> So one of the places where we were definitely ahead of the curve was in the, the automotive world. And uh, I was told this poem actually originated with uh, ambulance drivers, but I don't know. It, it, it pops up quite frequently. So definitely one of the places where Ford really shined was uh, the production of, the, of ambulances. Uh, King Motors made ambulances, Buick made ambulances, Packard made ambulances, Cadillac made ambulances. But the one that most people remember is the Ford. Uh, Walt Disney drove one when he was an American and ambulance uh, volunteers. Uh, Hemingway drove one. So we were, we were definitely ahead of the curve in motor vehicles. Uh, we dabbled. The first real inquiry into automotive, into motor vehicles for the military came around 1904 and there was a, some people at West Point did a study. Uh, 1914, uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers sat down with the government and started talking about coming up with standardization for uh, military vehicles. Uh, and then, you know, the, the punitive expedition in Mexico, you know, Pershing had the Cadillac that he really liked and you know, it was chasing Pancho Villa around in the desert and some Cadillacs and some Dodges. So they proved that it, you know, there was a, a functionality. Uh, yeah, 1904 was really the first documented stu official study. But then, you know, it wasn't really until 1912 that they really started looking at it. <clears throat> so one of the things that, that, and this predates the American entry into the war, is the Liberty truck. Uh, you know, 19, the, the Society of Automotive Engineers is, is created in you know, 1911, I believe. Uh, anybody, Howard Coffin, who was uh, vice president of uh, Hudson Motor Car Company, was a huge driver behind, behind the SAE, and he was a huge proponent of standardization across the board. Uh, he, he believed it would be easier for the car companies to survive if they settled on common sizes. You know, I believe you know the early car companies had like 800 different kinds of lock washer, and so they're like that's kind of silly. Uh, but the SAE and the Army really began seeing down and talking about military vehicles seriously around 1914. And uh, one of the things that they wanted to avoid was having the the government go out and buy a Cadillac or buy a Chevrolet or buy a Buick. They wanted them to buy an Army truck. And they were still thinking in the lines of the, the, the depot and arsenal system. So they're like, okay, we, we designed a truck that has the same axle, same engine, same frame, same body. And we, and we can go out to and bid to the automotive world and say, we need 200 axles. And they would build the axles, they would deliver them to the depot, and then the depot would take all the parts and build a truck. It didn't. It sounded like a good idea, but it didn't work as well as it. it. But they came up with two two designs: the standard A and standard B. Uh, they were good trucks. They actually did what they were supposed to do. It was some early, you know early four wheel drive. Uh, the standard B. These actually did make it over into the into the theater of, of operations. But uh, you know, three to five ton. And they built 9,500 by 15 different manufacturers. 7,500 actually made it overseas. Uh, 
Uh, I love the Liberty you know, four-speed transmission with 52 horsepower with a 15 mile per hour top speed. That's just, that's just a, it's a rocket. And, it's, and it looks kind of like a Conestoga wagon. <clears throat> but they worked. They worked. And the Army was using these up until the 30s. They, they, were, they, they were rebuilding them and upgrading them. And, and you, you still see it, you still saw them. In fact, there's pictures of the 1936 maneuvers here in Allegan County in Michigan. And you can see some Liberty trucks in the background. So Michigan companies that were involved in the production of the Standard A and Standard Bs, you know, Republic, Denby, Thomas and Thomas, Packard, you know, Timken Axle, making axles, Russell Axle, Hinkley Motors, Continental Motor Division made the mo engines. Uh, there was recently a Liberty up for sale had a Continental in it. Were you trying to buy that one? No, but we were actually trying to buy that one. I know. It was, it was down in Michigan. I wanted to buy it. You know? The boss said no. <laughs> McCord Manufacturing, you know, covert gear. So there's a, there's a ton of them. But meanwhile, in the real world, you know, everybody's wondering, like, this is a really a cool concept. We're going to make these standardized vehicles. You know, they're running around trying to come up with this great idea and solve all the world's problems. But now we go back to the original problem. You have all these different procurement entities out there running around trying to buy stuff for the war effort. <clears throat> and uh, it was a mess. So by the end of the first year of Operation France, the, the US Army had over 200 makes of vehicles in service, both domestic and foreign, captured enemy vehicles, whatever you could get your hands on, which it really isn't much different, you know. I know I, I know from personal experience that you leave something unattended for 10 minutes in the war zone and somebody's only able to come along and take it. So I spent six months chasing, state, chasing missing Humvees around. So it still goes on. So the United States goes to the war in 1917. We had uh, 3,039 trucks, 437 automobiles, 670 motorcycles, 12 tractors. 18 months later, we had 85,000 trucks alone. That's not, that's not even counting all the other stuff. And civilian production never stopped. In fact, this was a, the, the war industry's board, and uh, they fought with the auto industry. And the auto industry was like, no, people are still buying cars. All these, pe all these war workers are making all this money. They want cars. We're going to make cars because we're selling them. And you know, the, the war industry's board kept trying to trying to s shut off the steel supply to them and ration it. And then the auto companies just hoarded it and hid it from them. And, and then they tried to shut off the railroads so they couldn't get the stuff delivered. And yeah, you know, everybody says, oh, everybody works together in time of war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, you know, World War II, everybody, you know, everybody, World War II. Japan attacks on December 7th and December 8th, you know, tanks are rolling out the back end of the factories. And now, now there was strikes, there was black market, there was profiteering, there was all kinds of crazy stuff going on. You just don't talk about it. But there was a lot of, there was a lot of craziness that went on here. So the United States was involved in World War I for just about 18 months. Uh, we really never switched to, to full war production. We didn't really start any war production until war was actually declared. And most of the products either arrived too late or never arrived in theater. Uh, there's a lot of people that, t that talk about, you know, the, there's, there, the war profiteers or war hogs or merchants of death and all of the, you know, how corrupt everybody was. And one of the things you, you really have to remember is that most of this stuff was intended to arrive in theater for the spring offensive in 1919. We were sending troops over and in, in in putting them into combat with, with French and British equipment. And the big push was going to be in the spring of 1919. Uh, summer of 1918, the, the Germans launched a major offensive. They were winning. I mean, there was no sign that the Germans were going to. But then there's the mammoth economic collapse in Germany and the, what, what's commonly referred to as the October Revolution. Uh, 
and the, the German economy collapses and the German government collapses. And again, that whole other lecture, this is why you know, the German army is in the field, un, is winning. And that's the whole stab in the back theory comes out of all this stuff. But that's the reason why most of this stuff never made it, because we never had, the Germans collapsed from within unexpectedly. We were not, we were not expecting it. And the war ends, and the contracts are terminated, and everybody comes back home. So that's really kind of what happened. We got, we got time for one more short one, right? Yeah. OK, so anybody here know the Austin Motor Car Company? You know this story? It's a cool story. I like this story. So Herbert Austin creates the Austin Motor Car Company in England in 1905. You know Austin, Austin Mini. The cool, those cute little cars from the 60s. So the Austin Motor Car Company is created in 1905. In uh, 1914, the company had 2,500 employees, but by 1918, it had 22,000 employees, many of which were women. And their factory had a dormitory. And you know, you can't put women and men in a dormitory together. That would be just disgraceful. So they needed some place for all these employees to live. But the Austin Motor Car Company it was out in the middle of nowhere. There was no town nearby. Uh, transfer, it, you have to picture England in 1918. You're at war, 1917, 1960. You're at war, you've been at war for two, three, four years. You know, raw materials are at a, ma at, at a, at a premium. Fuel is at a premium. You're running, they're running on fumes. I mean, the British and the French were both on the verge of collapse. So it was very, you had limited transportation. So they needed something that was close to the plant. So on the 16th of November 1916, they bought 120 acres of farmland, and they decided they were going to build temporary housing. But you know, all the wood you know, in, in England has been appropriated for the war. What do you, you, know, you got nothing. So they came here to Bay City, Michigan. Uh, anybody familiar with the Aladdin Manufactured Home Company? You used to be able to buy them out of the Sears catalog. Remember Sears? <laughs> yeah, catalogs, exactly. I bet you, you probably get one on Amazon now. But uh, the total cost of the order was uh, 115000 And they ordered an entire town. And uh, they were shipped across. There was actually two shipments uh, from, my, from the history I read. One of them was sunk, so there's down at the bottom of the ocean somewhere in the North Atlantic, there's an entire town in the hold of a ship. Uh, but the, the one made it across, it, and in November 1917, the houses had been erected and were occupied by the uh, Austin workers. So that's the floor plan. This was the house they bought. Yeah, not, not big, not by any standard, but actually, you know, by European standards, it's pretty good to, this is a pretty good house. Uh, yeah, nothing fancy. And there's the Austin Village. There's a picture of it. That was the layout of it. See the railhead and then the town, two little, uh, four little squares. That's what the houses looked like. And they're still there. So in the middle of the English countryside, there's a town that was built here in Bay City, Michigan. And it's still there. I, I think, I believe the entire town is still, I think, I believe I read that one house burned down somewhere in the last hundred years. But the, it's, it's a historic, they're very proud of their little town. They have, they, they have a really cool book that they wrote about, about it. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm in the process of writing my master's paper on this topic. So after October, this, will, this presentation will probably change based on the outcome of that paper. <laughs>